For those of you who don't know me, I am Caitlin Pena. I am the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. I'm the one who's probably been sending you emails reminding you to attend this meeting. Um, and here tonight we have Felix Sargent. He is um, the board chair of the Center for Election Science, and he is going to be the one leading the discussion and interviewing Jed Limke, who um, is the one of the founders of Reform Fargo and one of the citizens who led the initiative to get approval voting implemented in Fargo. And then we've also got Andrea Denault. She was our education campaign coordinator in Fargo. So she was hired by CES to um, make sure that all the Fargo voters knew what uh, approval voting was and why it was going to benefit them. Um, so I'm really excited because it's going to be fun to kind of reminisce about the campaign and then also talk about the super exciting first ever approval voting election in the US um, and what Jed and Andrea are thinking about for that because that's coming up in just a few weeks. So with all of that being said, I will hand it off to Felix. Um, oh, really quick. Let me just lay some ground rules here. If you guys have questions, feel free to stick them in the chat. Um, I can also unmute you selectively if you use the raise your hand feature by clicking on um, the participants button, but we'll wait until the, the actual Q&A portion towards the, end of the, um, towards the end of the meeting for uh, all of the Q&A. Um, and I know Jed kind of has a hard stop at the top of the hour, so we're going to try to keep, um, keep, be respectful of the time. Um, and those of us with CES, and if Andrea has time, we might be able to stay on a little bit later if you guys still have more questions. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll, I'll hand it to, to Felix. Hi, everyone. I'm Felix Sargent. I'm the chair of the Center for Election Science, and I'm very happy that everyone is able to, to be here and join us for this discussion. Um, Jed, Andrea, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. I am incredibly surprised uh, that we, you know, it's been this long and we've actually never spoken before. Um, so, um, hello, it's, it's, it's really an honor and thank you for all the work that you've done in order to be able to move not only this, you know, uh, you know, do the work you have in Fargo, but to help the Center for Election Science and honestly to help the country. Uh, if I, you know, don't sound a little bit too flag wavy uh, there. <laughs> Yeah, you bet. Nice to meet you, too. I wanted to start off um, first kind of going over the timeline for um, Fargo, just for, for everyone who, who may not be necessarily familiar with the, with the intimate details. Um, it, this all started off in 2015 after uh, Tony Garrick uh, won with 21.8% of, of voter support. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then, you know, <laughs> has taken up until uh, 20, 2018, 2019 in order for it to actually happen. And then, you know, now we're finally having the election. It's a good five yeah. years. Um, what were you doing in 2015? And did you anticipate that this would you know, take this long and this would be the path <laughs> that it would go down? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm a software engineer and I just, I remember... I remember when he was elected, and it's nothing against Tony, um, but I remember when he was elected and he did say something about having a mandate of the people when he's elected. And I don't think that a mandate of the people makes any sense when four out of five people didn't vote for you. Um, and I thought, well, that, that's kind of ridiculous. And then um, the following year, uh, we had a regular election. So Tony was elected in a special election after the death of our mayor, and there's some shuffling around of commissioners. And um, then we had a regular election the following year, and the two commissioners who were elected, who incidentally are running for re-election this year, um, they were both elected with basically the same um, situation. Four out of five people didn't vote for them, basically. And that doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily get that support or support of more people, but um, citizens weren't able to really, um, they didn't have a flexible enough voting method to show that they could support all these candidates necessarily. Um, so after that election, there was local pressure from not only the citizenry, but uh, the local paper. And there was a push to do something about it. So the city commission itself formed an elections and governance task force. And as soon as they said they were forming that, I thought to myself, well, I need to be on that thing, or at least try. Um, 
So I looked through the list of commissioners and I picked one that I figured might be um, receptive to having a nobody um, call them and pester them and then maybe end up on this thing. And lo and behold, I was appointed to the task force. Me, along with a whole bunch of current and former politicians and local you know, business leaders, and then just little old me. And um, yeah, uh, we went through the process. We talked about lots of things in the city. We talked about um, increasing the number of commissioners we had. We talked about changing the structure entirely. Uh, for those who don't know, Fargo itself is a city commission. And um, what that means is that we have four commissioners who are all elected at large, two at a time. And then we have a mayor who's elected at large. And in the end, we looked at all this stuff and the task force uh, recommended switching the city of Fargo over to approval voting for future elections and increasing the size of the commission by two. So then that went to the city commission and the city commission basically sat on it for a year and then killed it in December of 2017. And I was frustrated. <laughs> and um, then, then we started. <laughs> and then we said, well, um, we have the ballot initiative process not only in North Dakota, but in the city of Fargo. So we um, started to organize and um, learn more about what we could do. And we gathered signatures. And pretty soon we gathered only, you know, 2,000 signatures, but that's, you know, well more than what we needed in order to get on the ballot. And yeah, <laughs> the fall came, or during the, the course of us uh, collecting signatures as well, uh, we had another election um, where four out of five people didn't vote for the winners. And that just went to reinforce our point. And yeah, then we had uh, the general November election uh, for everything but city offices. City offices are decided in June. And uh, we were on the ballot and we won with um, two out of three people voting for us instead. <laughs> so uh, quite the switch from how the commissioners were getting elected. Like we had something that was actually, you know, the majority was in favor, which was nice. Um, so yeah, and now we're here uh, preparing for an election in just a few weeks. <laughs> and hopefully it goes well, we anticipate that it will. It's very exciting. I um, uh, I do want to check in with you a little bit. Um, your camera has turned offline, and we're seeing like a oh my gosh logo -y thing. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, well, I sounded good. I hope. Yeah, you sounded little, great. But... I I sounded great. I it. Okay. That's crystal a... clear, <laughs> oh, Josh. Good. Crystal clear. Well, that's a start. Hey, there we go. Hey, perfect. Uh, I exist again. Maybe at least for a minute. Yeah. So. Um, hey. So that explains what I was seeing. So that explains this. <laughs> um, and so I've got um, a question for for Andrea uh, to to pull her in. Andrea, um, you know, tell me how you got involved with with the campaign and what you think some of the unique challenges or maybe even advantages were to educating people about the campaign. And and now that you've won the campaign, how do you plan on educating people about how to actually vote in an approval voting election? So many questions rolled into one. Sorry, um, yeah. That's okay. Tell me everything about you. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, Jet had been working on approval voting, I think for like two years before I had ever even heard about it. But um, I was working as a lobbyist at the state capitol in Bismarck. Um, and I remember seeing an event page for uh, some uh, presentation about a new voting method and I think for most people that wouldn't be enough to excite them enough to drive the three hours to go <laughs> see this presentation but um at that time is when and that was in Fargo um, so you had to drive from Bismarck to Fargo yeah wow um at that time was when uh ranked choice voting was getting a lot of press and so I you know like everyone um, was familiar with ranked choice voting, had never heard of approval voting in my life. Um, so I went and saw Jed. Uh, he gave a presentation at the Sons of Norway. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever met him. And uh, yeah, I, I was really, really impressed. I, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't totally sold because I, like many people, already was sold on the idea of ranked choice voting. <laughs> and so um, I, I've been kind of like reflecting on it tonight and, and thinking, you know, all throughout the campaign, 
Um, one thing that, that we struggled with is getting it through to people that approval voting is, is literally so simple, you cannot wrap your head around it. Like it, it really confuses people because it's just too <laughs> simple, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think that I, I was one of those people, you know, Jed gave a, I, I, I'm guessing a full hour presentation um, that first time that I had <laughs> seen him present on it. And, um, you know, I have ADHD. I could have got lost somewhere in the weeds. I'm not really sure. Um, I didn't write it off, here, here. but you know, I, I was intrigued. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, well, I don't know what it was. He's... Maybe, it... sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, it's so simple. You can explain it in about 15 seconds, but explaining why it's so, you know, <laughs> why you need it. That's, that's the problem. That, that's the hour. That's the, mm -hmm. and then just dealing with the, questions and the confusion with well i've heard of ranked choice this is that no no not yeah. that. why do we need to yeah. do this <laughs> yeah and and so, so that radicalized um, you and this was when the campaign the you know the this is when they were already preparing to do a campaign this wasn't just in front of the commission was that right i'm not sure at that stage where you were jed as far as like no. did, was reform fargo even established at the point at which you gave that <sighs> Sons of Norway presentation, or um, were you just doing a, that as a hobby? Okay. Yes, yes. I mean, and this no. has all been a I mean, hobby it, for you, but yeah. Officially, we didn't form the C four until twenty eighteen, and this would have been in twenty seventeen when you would have seen this. Um, so it was more of a we had presented our findings to so the, the task force I was on presented its findings to the city commission on Valentine's Day of twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. I, I distinctly remember this. And then they said, all right, well, we'll look at it next week at the regular meeting. And then they didn't, you know, like I you know, rallied some supporters. Let, let, let's go, let's go there and be there for this. And then they said, oh, well, we'll defer it for two weeks from now. And then after you know, a month of this, they stopped even pretending to defer it. And, um, and it's not because all the commissioners were against it by any means either, but you know, to make things happen. You got to get seconds and you got to do all this stuff. And yeah, so somewhere in there I said, well, day gummit, I'm going to do something about it. And I, you know, uh, made a Facebook page and made a website. And then I was able to get in with the Sons of Norway to do a presentation, which would have been for the League of Women Voters, I think, just on civic issues to try to help drum up more pressure. And I think that's where you would have seen it. Great. Um, yeah, so I, I think that I got like, I'm going to, I'm going to wager to guess that I may have gotten like top wonk status in the state of North Dakota that day for making that drive to come here, a presentation about voting methods. I could be wrong, but I was very intrigued and I want to learn more. Um, and yeah, I think that you and I like were briefly introduced after the event, um, but a bunch of people had questions for you, so I didn't really get to talk to you very much. Um, and then... Yeah, so I don't know what it was. Six months later, a year later, like you guys called and were like, hey, heard you were a good organizer. Do you, do you want to organize for approval voting? And I was like, maybe, but can you explain it to me again? And I, <laughs> I remember you being very patient with me on the phone um, and me, you know, finally kind of like in that moment, like wrapping my head around the simplicity um, and then, yeah, you know, doing a little bit more research on my own. Um, yeah, I was pre pretty, you know, fully on board after that. I will say I forgot to grab yeah. this as a visual, um, but I remember as I was leaving my previous job, you know, to come, um, like, organize this approval voting campaign, Aaron Hamlin sent me a, um, a PDF handbook on uh, how approval voting works. I don't know if all of you guys have read this handbook, but I, I'm pretty sure it's at least a thousand pages. Like, and I printed it out <laughs> at my previous job, Sounds not right. paying attention to the size of the document. And I, I left the room and came back. <laughs> it felt like maybe I owed oh, my no. employer some money because whoops. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm never gosh. gonna read this. And it, you know, it's had like mathematical equations in there that I was not prepared yeah. to, to deal with and I was like um 
you know. I mean, I, I, like you want to get into the droop quota with a few people and diverge your law, but no, we don't actually want to do that at all. <laughs> you can help it when you're on the street. So, yeah. oh yeah. 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 It, 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 yeah. It, it, that's one of the things that's actually the most um, uh, exciting and impressive about, um, about Fargo is that um, it wasn't just that you organized and you moved forward, but you managed to create a campaign that used amazing visual design in order to keep everything very simple. You didn't, you know, you talked about approval voting, but you talked also so much more about, about the impacts of approval voting. You didn't get into the, the theory or the mathematics of it. You um, uh, did a really good job keeping it as simple as it needed to be, if not simpler. Um, <laughs> You know how much um, the, all, these campaigns are built fundamentally on uh, on on the people, and once you knew that you needed to be able to go out and gather signatures, um, you know how much did you feel that you were relying on? I don't know the the design more uh, in order to be able to help convert people and have them uh, you know, respond as opposed to just simply the, the, the mathematics of, of the system. I, I think that the design um, was absolutely important. Um, when we started this thing, aside from a handful of, you know, diagrams and a, and a cute explainer video that um, CES had already, there really wasn't a lot of stuff out there. So that's why we, like, we had to do it all from scratch. We, <laughs> there's no choice. Like, we need to be able to communicate this. And, yeah, um, so absolutely, it was really important, I think, um, to do it. Uh, when we were gathering signatures, we had um, like a handful of different designs that we had plastered to the backs of our clipboards. Um, so like different people every day when I'd hand out clipboards or however we do it, um, they'd have different examples that they could show. And if we were paired up on a street corner gathering signatures, we made sure that the two of us would have different ones. So we could be like, well, this is, you know, this is how this works. And, and look at how much people really love hamburgers instead of pizza or something like some sort of simple, you know, explainer like that or a sample ballot, you know, talking about how if you split the vote, then Lex Luthor becomes mayor, you know, and we would just want to try to fight that. So, yeah, I think that the graphics were really important and just trying to keep everything as simple as we could all the time. That, that's why if you've seen our design, then you can see we just very Spartan and minimalist, but bright. Like we wanted it to be noticed, and then we didn't want it to be too complicated. And that's what we went for. Uh, Do you find uh, any particular argument was most effective at, at, at converting someone to give their signature? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, when we point out when we remind people, especially older voters, um, that they've been in the situation of having to choose between the lesser of two evils, um, and then you know begrudgingly voting for someone before, um, th that was a particularly compelling argument for many people. Um, up here with the election equipment that we had, um, it wasn't compatible with any other type of reform aside from this, basically. So we could point out that this is cost effective. It was my least favorite argument to use, but it definitely would, you know, sway some people. And then just reminding people again and again, you know, four out of five people didn't vote for the winners of these elections. And you, know, you say that enough to people like that, that really drives it home. And I think that that is an argument that you could make in every municipality in this country. I'm pretty sure you could say, yeah, most people didn't vote for who won this, is, you know, if it was a contested race, so, which many of them are. And you know, so just bringing that up again and again um, would get it through. And sometimes, you know, you'd get into arguments, you know, I mean, discussions, uh, spirited discussions uh, with people and, um, and, and explain, um, you know, get a little bit deeper pretty soon, you know, I remember asking um, a handful of different people over the course of the campaign, you know, pointing out that, you know, according to the world's smallest uh, political quiz, you know, it's something like 40 some percent of Americans are libertarian, according to this quiz. Yet, yeah, or maybe it was only 30 percent. But the point was, you know, how many you know libertarians are in the you know the Senate? How many libertarians are in the House? I mean, they're not making it, and it's because of how this method works. And I could say that for you know the Green Party as well, as as far as that goes. I mean, you can make these arguments and point out, you know, like something is not lining up here 
obviously people have disagreements with um, or are upset with how these elections are shaking out, but they just keep the, thinking that, oh, it's something to do with the candidates, and it's not. You know, and you point out to them, no, actually this thing that you've been overlooking for years is really important. And that's another part of why it was so hard sometimes to explain to people that it needed to change because when they think about voting to them, it was, well, I go in and I fill in an oval or I push a button on a screen somewhere and then it's over. They never thought about why they only got to push, push one button before. Yeah. And getting people to get that click, and it's always satisfying when someone had, had come to them and that it makes sense and you'd see it start to turn and they'd realize, oh, there are ways to make decisions, especially by pointing out, you know, when you make a decision with a group of friends about where to go eat and like four of them name different burger places and two of them both say, let's go to Pizza Hut. And then you say, well, we're going to Pizza Hut because that's, you know, plurality rules or whatever. And then, you know, they realize, yeah, you're right. We don't make decisions like that in real life. I ask them, then why are we doing that for these important ones? These are supposed to be important. They're in charge of our taxes and our roads and, and you know, everything else that's important to us in our local government. Well, why are we using the worst method ever to do that? And you know, it worked after a while. Uh, I, it, sorry, it's just, it's really great oh, hearing the conversations that you've, uh, <laughs> no, don't apologize for anything, like hearing the conversations that you've had with people who actually, you know, get a chance to go out and, and, and change this. Um, <laughs> One of the things that uh, I'm really excited for, so there are two commissioners that uh, their uh, their obligations expire in June 2020, uh, just before mm -hmm. the election. Um, and then there are uh, seven candidates who are running for the election. Um, yeah. The, uh, and, and two of them are the, you know, the, so, so two of them are, are, are running for their same spots. So there are five yeah, new comments. candidates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the things that's very interesting is that this is still an, an at-large election. The the top two will get their seats. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Um, and that was, you know, I am not necessarily the most pragmatic person on the planet, but um, there is certainly an argument to be made that um, you're not going to be able to walk in and say, well, not only do we need to switch to approval voting for the first time in the nation, uh, but we need to switch to some sort of proportional system or something because we're electing two at a time. And like I said before, Fargo, it's, it's at large. We don't have wards. Again, we didn't want to come up and say, well, we've got to switch to wards and switch our voting system. That's just going to be a kitchen sink of a thing, and it's not going to work. Um, or it's likely to fail because someone's going to take umbrage with one or both parts. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, uh, we, we did what we could, <laughs> basically, in the end. Um, yeah, and we have, uh, we have six people, or well, seven people running for office, technically. Um, one of them did drop out officially, but their name will still be on the ballot, um, you know, come June here. But yes, it's the top two who will win. That's block-style approval voting. Um, even uh, Dr. Stephen Brahms, uh, one of the main um, advocates, not the co-inventor or inventor of approval voting, or at least modern yeah. approval voting, um, he even wrote a letter in support to point out that yes, this is still okay, especially for an executive body like this, like it's fine. We're electing two people at a time, it's fine. Great. Um, when, sorry, I lost my turn of thought. The, one of the, I think the, the biggest question that, that we're getting in, in the comments is, uh, why not RCV? Why, why did RCV not really pass muster with the, um, uh, uh, not, not the commission, the, um, the task force. The task force. Okay, um, so RCV was, is it number one, RCV is better than what we have normally. Well, not here, but as far as I'm concerned, but uh, the rest of the country, yes, I, I agree, RCV is still better. But um, it didn't make it to the task force for a handful of reasons. Well, um, the argument I hated the most, uh, but still the one to sway, sway people a lot, uh, was that our election equipment just didn't support uh, range choice. Uh, there's no way to do it. Um, yeah, our municipality didn't have that equipment. Um, an interesting side fact, uh, the entire state of North Dakota um, uses the exact same model of election equipment, and we just upgraded the whole state to a new model of election equipment entirely. They don't piecemeal it. It's not like many other states where different municipalities have different um, devices. We're all the same thing. For There's a standardization there for better and for worse. Hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, so RCV, um, it did. Um, it, it definitely, we, we talked about, we talked about ranking. And um, 
and everything along those lines. Um, but there are a handful of problems with RCV. Um, number one, like I said, um, our equipment didn't support it, so it was kind of dead in the water in the first place because there was no convincing, or it was not worth trying to convince as far as I was concerned. Um, the, you know, the citizens of Fargo that we need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on new election equipment. Um, just so we can change how our elections work in this case when there are other options out there. Um, so uh, secondly, um, I think that uh, approval was just so much simpler than RCV. And, and there's great arguments for it because many people think about, you know, like, well, I have a personal ranking of what I like the best or which candidates is first in my mind and second and third. Um, but I, I did what I could after studying all these methods and arguing in favor of RCV a bit, but also arguing in favor of approval, um, I, I did what I could to, to explain that when you're making a decision yourself, yes, there are lots of different ways, lots of different hierarchies you can have in your head and rankings or whatever of how you evaluate these candidates. But when a group makes a decision, which is what an election is, um, those don't always translate in a simple way. There's lots of little niggling little details that come in there um, that can really distort um, what, what the group wants. And when we look at, um, you know, favorite betrayal, um, you know, um, that, that occurs in RCV, that's really the pits. I mean, we, we can see that if you want to rank somebody really high um, in RCV, they better either be really strong so they can survive kind of those rounds that occur to get to the end, or they better be weak and get the heck out of the way so someone else that you like but rank lower on your ballot still has a shot. Otherwise, they can still split one another's votes and you yourself for voting the way you did can end up with a worse winner than you would have in a, in frankly, a better method out there. Yep. Um, the, uh, did you ever find that there were, you know, when you were when you were canvassing and going out there, that people will, you know, use RCV as a way to not endorse it, or did you find that the people who were like, well, what about RCV? Did they say, uh, no, I only want RCV, or did you find that they were like, well, this is like RCV and it's better than the system we have. Let's sign it. Because oftentimes there's a tribalism that's currently happening in our community, yeah. and I want to see mm -hmm. whether when the when the rubber hits the road and you need to sign something which says, you know what, I approve of approval voting, you know, wh whether people will make that trade off. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, to use your phrase, when the rubber meets the road, for the most part, um, people were happy to see us moving away from first past the post. So they're, they're in our community as people who are, you know, passionate about, you know, voting methods and actually have used the word voting method when speaking with their friends and family. Um, we, we have a different opinion um, on how important these things are. Um, the public at large who isn't familiar with the fact that there are different ways to elect people, um, they don't, they're much more swayable, really. And I understand that you're asking about people who've already heard of RCV and they're, they're on that train, but they're on that train because they recognize that there are problems out here. When you point out to them that yes, there's actually more than one solution to how to do this. And this is not only attainable, but it's ridiculously simple. And you've used it a lot more in your personal life than you've ever used RCV <laughs> when making group decisions. Um, that sways a lot of people. I mean, who is mm -hmm. sitting here going, well, gosh, where should we eat tonight? I'm going to rank every restaurant in town and let, let's, let's go through the process and have a runoff. I mean, it's ridiculous. That is not <laughs> how people make decisions. Um, so, you know, approval just, just it's, it's so much simpler. And the simplistic argument really helped um, yeah. with many of, the, many of the doubters out there. And yeah. Are there people who did not vote for this because it's RCV or bust? Absolutely. And there are plenty of people who didn't vote for it because it was first past the post or bust. But, you know, two out of three Fargo voters voted for this because they wanted to see something better. And tr truly, I mean, I'm in Fargo, North Dakota. There are lots of communities that are like us yeah. across the nation that have the same people with the same questions and making the same arguments. And, you know, it's doable. We've proven that it's doable in a place that I'm pretty sure most people would not have expected <laughs> this to happen ever. And we did it here. Tell me about what you see for the, the future. I mean, we're going to have the election. There's going to be a win. Well, there's going to be two winners. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
like, do you have any, like, total back of the envelope, like, they're going to win with X percent of the ballot uh, in, your, in your mind? You know, uh, you have to pick out which candidates, just what do you think they're going to win by? And then, you know, where is there going to be another campaign in order to get approval voting uh, elsewhere in North Dakota? Uh, yeah, so I'm really hopeful um, that not only... I mean, obviously the plurality winners will win, but I'm really hopeful that we'll get some clean majorities um, winning here. It's not guaranteed. Um, as I had to point out to every reporter I ever spoke to, because they would, they would always report and they'd say something about, well, and this has a majority. And it's like, no, no, not necessarily. We're, we're hoping. <laughs> we're hoping that I'll get there, but we can't <laughs> promise that. Like, that's when I start to dive into the weeds and make a reporter's eyes glaze over. But um, we... I am hopeful that we will see candidates winning win in the 50s and 60s percent. And in a six-way race, even for two seats, that just hasn't ever happened here that I know of. Um, it's not possible, so, really. Yeah, it's, it's really not. I mean, yeah, you'd have to be, you'd have to be you'd running have to against a lot of just clowns. A, yeah, you'd have to be running against a dream slate of loathsome people in order to even remotely get there. Um, so that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, so, so I'm hopeful that we'll get there. Um, maybe the realistic approach, as I, as I really hedge here, is that we'll get some people in their 40s. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see 50s and 60s out of this. Um, you feel I've like been uh, working. This, oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, no, no I like just encouraged like I've been... other people to run, like like di like people from a different I... area or a moderate that would. Build um, so of the people running, uh, of the six who are still actively running, but we'll, we'll just say the seven, um, three of them have served in public office before, but the other four hadn't. Um, for our last election, I believe when I, I can't remember how many ran was it ten or eleven. Uh, something like that. Um, over half of them were incumbents. Um, I'm going to say, well, nine apparently ran. But yeah, um, I think it was five or six of them had run before. They weren't incumbents, but they had run before. They were incumbents at the time. Two of them were. And, and so right now we have more people running. Now, I'm not going to say that, well, it's because I went and you know, stood on the corner of Broadway and First with a clipboard for a summer. And that, that's why these candidates decided to run. Um, but I, I will say that we're hopeful that um, it's going to continue to help you know, make office accessible for people who would not traditionally have even considered running, given that there are political machines out there. E mm -hmm. Even in this town, even if they're disorganized political machines, they do exist. And it's tough to get into those rooms sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I'm hopeful. But um, you asked about the future. And... Um, <sighs> The pandemic is a real pain in the butt. Um, so I think that that also limited, hampered how many candidates we have running, frankly. Um, it hit um, here, uh, you know, uh, a month and a half before the, the cutoff for, uh, for wow. signing up to, to run or collecting signatures. And there's just no time. Also, it's cold. I don't know if uh, you all know, but Fargo is cold. I mean, it snowed two days ago here. It's obnoxious. It should not be doing that in May, but whatever. Um, so pe people aren't gathering signatures for that, aren't necessarily sure they're ever going to run yet. I mean, commonly, we have people who decide within the last week. I mean, as you should, I think, honestly. Like, I, I mean, I don't want people to make last-second decisions, but I want people to take their time to make decisions before they run. It's a big responsibility uh, to serve in office or even try to do so. And if this thing hit, and I mean, this is the, the lowest candidate count that we've had in uh, a decade, I think. So wow. um, I'm hopeful that it'll help in the future. Um, but yeah, who knows about you know how the pandemic will affect things, but I'm confident that it's going to help in the future. And then... Yeah, um, maybe we get to take this um, to a county government or a neighboring government, or who knows? We'll go statewide, and then we'll we'll storm the White House or something, and then yeah, you know, it'll be crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I supposed to do a Howard Dean, right? So then go to North Dakota wah! or something like that. But you know, <laughs> like maybe they'll be coming. Maybe I'll call him and try to get him out here to campaign for us or something. Yep. I mean. <laughs> and you know the nice thing about about seeing this and and doing what I think everyone thought was impossible is that you just really do think that everything is possible at this point. Um, yeah. I mean, like, are you? Uh, 
So it sounds like you don't have any like specific plans of like, okay, we're going to do this city next or, um, you know, let's go for well, statewide. Is it a question of like how it plays out in the media or do you think it's just a question of there, there is a question. Of, there's a question of some of that. Like there's definitely a focus. Um, but I, you know, after the campaign, you know, I definitely took a break. But during the campaign, um, Fargo is sandwiched, it's the largest community, but it's sandwiched between two other, you know, signif significant communities on either side. And then a handful, you know, stuck in. I mean, we <laughs> Fargo itself would feel like a suburb to most people in the United States, but we've got suburbs too. So it's suburbs all the way down. And there are lots of communities here, but um, the conversations I've had with those elected officials and um, activists and just citizens in those cities, um, far more conversations with citizens than elected officials and activists, is that they want it, um, but you know, there's a little bit of hesitation, like, oh, how's it gonna work out? Uh, how's it gonna work out in Fargo? But mm -hmm. um, after we won, I mean, I, I received phone calls from people in every city with a population of over 20,000 uh, within a 500 mile radius, basically. Um, wow. So like, there's interest around here. It's just, they wanna see how this thing works out. And I'm hopeful that it will be clear that not only did it, did it function, but that it worked and um, they will want you know, us to do it too. We planted a seed, I'm hoping that it will flourish. That's great. That's, that's very, very exciting. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, questions I, I, I was excited to ask is, um, now, that you've, now that you've done this, what advice would you go back and give yourself? You could go, go back in time. Oh gosh, uh, man. <laughs> That, that is tough. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to hear what Andrea might say about this as well. Yeah. Yes. That, thank you. I know I've been, I've been monopolizing. Yeah. Um, uh, and Andrea, please, please uh, jump in. Yeah. Sure. So I, um, you know, my background in organizing prior to this was um, in human rights. And so, you know, <laughs> Those issues for me were relatively, you know, kind of easy to campaign for because, you know, for better or for worse, they're easier for people to understand. They can wrap their head around, you know, whatever it is you're talking about. Um, and yeah, trying to go in with, with um, the voting campaign is this sort of like nebulous blob of like, how do you, how do you like, yeah, like generate interest for the, a thing that like no one has heard of, much less like get people to help you to, you know, talk about the thing that no one has heard of. It In the beginning, it felt very challenging, but uh, one um, uh, story I've been reflecting on a lot today was, um, you know, because of my background in human rights and working for other nonprofits that had like no money and no budget, um, I just, I, yeah, I, I was used to just not having any money to work with, but kind of like, um, uh, just focusing on like emotional appeals and just getting people to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Um, whereas, you know, with this campaign, I actually had a budget and I was like, this is amazing. This is going to make my job so much easier. Um, <laughs> but, but I remember just being totally defeated, like, uh, one of the first times I walked into a Fargo ad agency thinking that I had tons of money to work with. And I was so excited to, um, you know, to, to talk about, you know, content for like a commercial and, you know, like newspaper ads and stuff like that. And they literally laughed in my face and they were like, uh, Heidi Heitkamp and Kevin Craver, both just spent $25 million on their ad campaigns. And those were um, two people running for Congress at the time. Uh, and it was the most expensive race in North Dakota history. Um, Might so, the U.S. history. It was so crazy. It was a big deal, yeah. And, and so um, I, I think from there, I, you know, I... I, I was really defeated because I was like, oh man, like I thought I had a lot of money, but I, as it turns out, like it's, it's not enough. And like, you know, we're going to have to run, 
just a straight ground game, you know? Um, and so that's what we did. And I like just was amazed that it worked out. Um, I just saw that like Dakota joined the call. Um, Dakota was like our, our first um, pretty like heavy hitter volunteer insofar as that like she literally quit her job so that she could come hand out flyers on the streets with us. Like she just threw herself all in and so um yeah we built up a huge volunteer base and um you know i guess like just kind of going back to that you know not only competing for like media attention if, you know from this extremely contentious um congressional race happening in our state um that that means that we were also competing for like political attention from our own community. Um, because as far as anyone here was concerned, uh, at that point, the city commission race was already over. And so to try to get people excited about um, a municipal vote for an election that, you know, had just passed, um, or excuse me, to get people excited about a municipal uh, ballot initiative, um, when there's so much in the news every single day about, you know, the, this big congressional race. Um, yeah, th that was a huge challenge. But I, I think that um, the way that Jed and I work together and the way that Dakota and I work together, like we really just brought such like complimentary, thank God, like such complimentary skill sets to the campaign. Um, Jed literally had to teach me how to make spreadsheets like on one of the first <laughs> nights that we hung out um Dakota and I both like have worked in uh restaurants most of our lives I mean I did have a background in organizing but um you know I bartended well into my 30s it, you know and so for us you know like Dakota and I it was more about like just hustling the way that we knew how to hustle which is you know to be as charming as possible and like you know <laughs> we've made our living trying to you know, charm people to get a buck. And so I think that we just sort of like used that same tactic in terms of winning the election, but also like getting people to care enough about this to volunteer for it. And um, yeah, I was really, really excited when I found out, because I had meetings with, with all of the political parties in North Dakota. I met with the, um, the, uh, state director for the Republicans, and I met with the Democrats, I even met with the um, Green Party, Socialists, Libertarians, like pe I met with all the people. And um, yeah, like, uh, it was, it was interesting because, sorry, <laughs> the people I found out who were like least likely to endorse were politicians from like almost across the spectrum and, and eventually I realized it was because like oh a lot of them actually benefit from vote splitting and they didn't want to yep. lose the possibility for that advantage um but I think that like once you know like regular people just citizens you know realize that this this actually like makes your voice stronger and mm -hmm. your vote stronger and your opinion more powerful um it was a pretty easy sell. And so, um, yeah, Jed was just, you know, he's just like a, a monster. He's, he's a total workhorse. <laughs> I asked him earlier today. Um, I was like, I was like, do you remember who the major like signature getters were, you know, besides so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so? and he goes, Oh, let me look. And he gives me this list of like, you know, six people or five people who were like, you know, these, everyone here got like around a hundred or less. Um, and then next to his name, he wrote 900. <laughs> wow. Like, uh, you know, uh, and he was doing this all on top of his, like, um, full-time job. Um, so he's, like, out pounding the pavement every day. Um, and, and, yeah, working with him was just, it was a blast and it was an honor. And, yeah, he, he's just a riot. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah, as far as, like, what he could do versus, you know, like, what I could do and what Dakota could do it was just um totally different but but complimentary um 
contributions. And I think that, you know, for me, I just really wanted to like humanize the campaign. And so I always joke, like, if you go back to the um, Reform Fargo website and go back through all their pictures, there's like a certain like divide where you can tell uh, the moment where I got access to Reform Fargo's like administrative, you know, their Facebook admin role. Um, because it went yeah. from like all graphics that like Jed had designed to suddenly like all these cute pictures of like all of our adorable volunteers and like, don't you want to come join the approval voting army? Come make history, you know? Um, and so we, well, like, we didn't really start with any volunteers yeah. for Pete's sake. <laughs> What's that? We didn't have any volunteers when I started for Pete's sake, to be fair. <laughs> but yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah, like, yeah. In, in the so, end. Yeah, we had so many. We really people. like built that base by you know kind of like promising people that they were going to be, you know, a part of like making history. Um, and yeah, like I said, I just tried really hard to you know humanize the campaign and, and show everybody else, you know, in Fargo, that this is something that's supported by you know literally dozens and dozens of other people. So much so that here we are volunteering, you know, for yeah. months and months on end. Um, and I, you know, I think that's ultimately, you know, what did it is that we, um, we were able to literally physically demonstrate to people how much support, um, this had in the community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, despite like not ever being able to afford a commercial or like any like significant <laughs> amount of ad space on any platform, um, mm -hmm. I think like organically, we actually had quite a reach um and yeah i yeah. i think that also speaks to the fact that like good ideas sell themselves um mm -hmm. yeah you know this came up in fargo because we already knew that there was a need for it um, yeah yeah but andrew the penny in the jar demonstration like we definitely swayed a lot of people with that <laughs> not even joking too hard like definitely i'm telling you yeah good ideas do you, want, do you want to explain the penny in the jar experiment? Not really, but I will. <laughs> um, yeah, so there were jars. Uh, so we tabled at a whole bunch of um, uh, civic events around the farmer's oh, markets and fairs this. and things. Yeah, yeah and we, um, we took some jars and we had some big mason jars and we flocked them black so you couldn't see inside them. And we went and withdrew $50 worth of pennies, which is a lot of pennies, let me tell you. And then we, we would hand people a penny and say, all right, over here, vote for, and we'd have some sort of question of the day, we'd ask, um, so who's the like most legendary musical artist? And they you know, have these choices and they, they drop a penny in. And then we said, all right, now do it again, but here's as many pennies as you need, one, max one per jar, now do the same thing. And the results would, you know, we <clears throat> yes, purposefully, we would choose artists. We'd be like, all right, here's a handful of similar ones, and then one that is different. Um, which is frankly the way that lots of political campaigns are, lots of races are, and then it, it was astounding because you'd, you'd see obvious vote splitting on the first past the post side, and then on the other side, you'd see, oh no, people do like you know rock more than bubblegum pop maybe today, or they like you know cheese curds more than French fries, even though we had ten kinds of cheese curds plus French fries at the state fair, or excuse me, at the, the county fair when we did it on the first past the post side. And um, yeah, so it was just, it was interesting um, how that all worked out. But we had so many volunteers. I mean, just signature gathers alone, we had 20 people who gathered signatures. And um, every signature was important, which was a big thing that we would point out. And then for the door knocking, uh, we had all of them plus more people um, knocking doors. So it was a big deal. And um, we only got one endorsement officially from another group wow. um, by the end of this whole thing, which was our, our local firefighter 642. And wow. they, yeah, they endorsed us. <laughs> and um, there's- We got, we got more endorsements yeah. than that. Did we, did we get a second one? I don't even remember. The league did I know, I know for sure that the ACLU is one of them. I, that's I right, the ACLU point. of North Dakota endorsed us. That's right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So sorry, sorry out there, ACLU of ND, <laughs> I forgot. But yeah, I just no, there I remember- were, There I, were others. Yeah, I felt like I met with the firefighters a lot. But yeah, it's just, yeah. And that was another thing. I mean, it's important uh, to meet with these people because these are also, you know, civic leaders in their own way and they, they know people too. It's really important to be willing to try to get out of your comfort zone. Um, I'm not a public speaker. I'm not a political, you know, organizer or whatever. This is the first time I've gotten involved in something like this. I wasn't someone like, yes, I know who Howard Dean is, but I'm not someone who, you know, can tell you about, 
you know, politics really um, growing up more than I, like, I vaguely knew who my parents voted for hmm. on the way up. This is just something, there was a problem that needed to be solved. Uh, I want to ask a little bit of a self-serving question, just since uh, since we've got a lot of uh, uh, donors and subscribers from the Center for Election Science um, uh, on the call. You know, how has the relationship with the Center for Election Science been, and you know, uh, any advice for us as we as we go to to, to support more campaigns, and uh, you know, like how how have yeah. we been able to support you? <laughs> Um, um, so you've been, you've been great. Um, you know, Aaron Hamler, Hamlin, yeah, <laughs> sorry, forgive me, <laughs> tongue tied today. Aaron Hamler, no, Aaron Hamlin has been, um, not only an excellent resource, it's but A.A. Ron. Um, a. A. Ron, yes, A.A. Ron Hamlin, um, has been an excellent resource and he's been, um, just, a uh, wonderfully, um, kind and open guy, um, to, to be able to talk with and, and you know, ask questions to, he's made himself available. So I think, you know, CES has really done a good job in having him around to, to help, you know, answer these questions and um, help to support us when we need things. And um, CES has been instrumental in, you know, helping, um, you know, giving us grants. You know, we applied for them, but you, you were kind enough to um, disperse grants on, on our behalf to, to help fund these things because grassroots efforts are really important and we can do a lot with volunteers but having a little bit of cash does help and it's, it's unfortunate but it's the truth i remember when we got the our initial grant um, we disclosed it even though legally we actually didn't have to at the time but we said no for transparency that's what we believe in as an organization we're going to disclose this and oh boy that that hit the papers that created a storm no one's ever spent $25,000 in a local election. And I went on the radio and said, well, actually, we don't only have $25,000. We have another $25,000 coming in two weeks. And um, we just leaned into it hard and just pointed out, guess what? It's expensive to do this. And we are thankful that people care enough across the country about this issue to help support us. Um, I could walk into a room and I could say abortion and everybody has an opinion. They know what it is. They know what their opinion is on it. But you walk into a room, you say election method and nobody has a clue what you're talking about. And it takes time and it takes effort. Um, and it takes, frankly, it does take some money in order to help let a lot of people know that um, this issue is important and that we need to do something about it. And so we just, you know, we'd lean in on that and we were just very thankful that CES was there um, to help us not only form the organization in the first place, uh, but be willing to take a call uh, when we, you know, call frustrated on a Thursday night with, with part of the campaign and, you know, help us figure out how we're gonna proceed, but, you know, to bounce ideas off of. But at the same time, um, CES has been very hands off in the actual, not only the day to day, but you know, how we necessarily, you know, would spend the money that we were generously granted and allowing us to maintain, you know, our kind of our local control over these decisions. And that's really important. And I'm thankful that's the way it's gone so far. Um, we're, we're glad that we are trusted that we know the, the area better than CES does. I've heard of <laughs> horror stories from, you know, other nonprofits and, groups and they say, oh, this worked in, you know, this worked in New Jersey. We're going to come here and we're going to set up like this. We're going to do this thing. And, you know, you know, is the country, while I believe that approval voting would be a great fit across the entire country, um, how you get there is definitely not a one size fits all solution. And CES has done a great job of ensuring that they don't try to rigidly enforce some sort of one size fits all conditions on how they help. They help when they need to and they don't help when they don't. And they're there if we need them. It's great to hear. <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a, a, a wonderful ringing endorsement. Um, I know that you have a hard stop at, at um, uh, I suppose it's is it seven o'clock your time. Um, but um, I also want to make sure actually. we can talk a few more minutes. It's okay. Uh, I want to make sure that I get some questions from the audience, and so I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin, who's been watching the chat. Sure. So anybody who has questions for Jed, feel free to go ahead and stick them in the chat. Um, so far. I've got two questions, I think, both from Colin Weaver. One is for Andrea, one is for Jed. Um, so Jed, this is, this is a pretty straightforward question. Colin asks, why did the commission at the time kill the recommendation in 2017? Was it approval voting, changing the commission size, or both? 
Oh, it was, it was both. Um, they, they <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to throw the commissioners under the bus here, but I'm going to throw them under the bus a little bit. Um, they, there was hesitance to have change. Um, and there was the fact that they've all gotten in there with the current system. And that's like, this harkens back to what Andrea was saying earlier about how um, local political operatives, local politicians were kind of the most resistant, for the most part, believe me, we had some people in our corner um, politically, um, but, or at least willing to, you know, like support us. But they saw it, these, many of these incumbents, they saw it as they're playing a sport, because politics is a game apparently, and they're playing a sport and these people want to come in and change the rules of how it works. And right now we are all star athletes in the way that it works. We do not want you changing how this works. And frankly, that's what helped us a lot too, because that's one argument I forgot to bring up. The ignoring approval voting, we could also point out, I got so many signatures. I'm sure I got 10%. I'm sure I got 100 signatures by, from someone who wasn't going to sign by, as they were backing, recoiling away from me, I would say, you know, the city commission sat on this recommendation, their own a recommendation from their own board that they appointed for over a year and then killed it without even daring to put it in front of the public for a vote because they are scared of how this will turn out. And that got some signatures too. Super interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think all of the learning more about um, the tactics and the things that you were able to say to get people to understand the importance of it is super interesting. Um, I could talk to you about that all day, probably. Um, and then Colin also wanted to know from Andrea, um, what did you initially find abrasive about approval voting and what made you change your mind? Um, sorry, what did I initially find? What was the question? He asked, what did you initially find abrasive about approval voting and what made you change your mind? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that I found it abrasive at all. I think, um, you know, like I said earlier, I was just someone who uh, had just become familiar with the concept that there was even more than one way to vote, period. Um, and the only other alternative method I'd heard of at that time was race choice voting, which I had become very excited about. So when I learned about approval voting, um, I think it, it threw me a little bit because like I said, it was, it was, it was too simple that I didn't get it, which was the case trying to explain it to people yeah. over and over. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we got our pitch down eventually, but it takes giving that pitch a lot of times um, before you finally realize, you know, mm -hmm. the, the quickest way you can possibly express this to someone. Um, I was also going to say, I'm sorry, I, I totally lost my train of thought because I was going in back and forth between my phone and my computer. But uh, when I was talking about the parties earlier, um, you know, in, in talking to the leaders of both parties, I was really happy when I found out that we, like our uh, volunteer base was actually larger than both uh, major political parties during that same campaign season. Um, which I just thought what? was amazing. Yeah, in um, our yeah, in our area at least. In the wow. city of Fargo, yeah, like not wow. statewide, definitely. Um, so mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was just kind of trying to drive the point home that, um, like, that's how much it was needed, and that's how much people were excited about it. You know, as interesting as like you know, big congressional races can be. Um, people really were invested in like just making their town better. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. That, that's where I was going with that and I lost track yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, local races are just so important. I mean, the, 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 they, affect, they affect the stuff right outside your house and your house most of the time <laughs> or wherever you live, your apartment or whatnot. So they're so important and, and people would understand that as we would go. And Andrea mentioned, yeah, pitches. Gosh, I mean, we, it took some time, but we all kind of refined, refined 
uh, re refound, re refined. Yeah, refined is the right word. We've all refined our pitches over time um, and figure them out. Like one of my favorites was you get to say thumbs up or thumbs down to every candidate instead of just one or two. Done. Ta da. You know? And, yeah, like I'm, um, I'm wearing just, the, the shirt with the people. thumb. I remember I, this was like a yeah. sort of a hotly shirts. contested uh, <laughs> debate during the campaign. It was like, is this a copyright infringement? Like, is this the Facebook thumb? Are we co-opting the Facebook thumb? <laughs> it was not. Um, it was not. <laughs> but like the thumb really was like, I think kind of a brilliant symbol for us because that that did kind of end up being our, our quickest possible pitch. You know, it's it, mm -hmm. using the body language. Yep. It is a literal thumbs up or a thumbs down on each candidate. You can thumbs up as many people as you want. Um, so, yep. yeah, I, I think that got the basics across to people in a pretty quick way. Um, and if I they have had any other questions that. after that. I, and I've, I've talked you, you about it it. voting for so long and I will use that because it explains it far more than like pick many. It's just thumbs up, thumbs down on every candidate. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I it. actually stole that as well. Like Chris and I have used it at um, when we've been talking to people at booths and stuff at events because it just. Oh, we have you on it, tape like that you, you stole it. it. We're going to get all the royalties. <laughs> I know. We've got to give you the copyright. Yeah. The royalties. <laughs> Sorry, Caitlin, go on. Um, but it does. It makes it so much easier because you tell people, you know, you can vote for as many candidates as you want, but they just don't get it until they either do it or you say it in another way. I, yeah. Um, and so the thumbs up and thumbs down really helps a lot. Uh, so thank you for that, for figuring that, yeah, that yeah. Uh, trick out to, to yeah, you bet. get through to people. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, to, so to all the um, other cities, get yourselves some thumb t-shirts and exercise. <laughs> The thumb pitch, because it was very helpful. That was a helpful. statement I never thought I'd hear. <laughs> <laughs> the thumb pitch sounds like the worst way to like throw a baseball. Yeah, um, it does, doesn't it? Oh man. <laughs> what's what's been your relationship so far with uh, St. Louis? Have you have you worked with them at all? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. They called me uh, before they even really started, and we had a a lot of conversations um, about not only you know the like the branding and like the thumbs up, thumbs down, and that type of stuff, um, but just you know just what our strategy was and how we organized. And yeah, it's been great. And um, I haven't called them to bug them to catch up on it because I know what it's like when you're in the middle of this thing. And the last thing you want to do is take another call from a looky loo out there trying, trying to see how it goes. But, um, um, yes, uh, we, we have a good relationship with them and uh, we absolutely wish them the best. We're really excited that they will be the number two city in the United States to get approval of voting. So yeah, we wish them the best for sure. Super exciting. Um, I do see that we have a participant with their hand up. Um, it's Marcus. So uh, Marcus, you can go ahead. You've been unmuted if you want to ask your question. Yeah. Um, how much more difficult do you think it would have been to get through a more complicated voting method, such as a proportional voting scheme, such as STV? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it definitely would have been more complicated because there's certain beauty in being able to say, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down to everybody, most votes wins, uh, where if I need to talk about STV or, you know, one of my personal favorites, you know, like sequential proportional, um, th there's a lot to it because you have to explain, well, it kind of goes into a black box in a sense, you know, because most people don't understand or want to take the time to understand, you know, how the, you know, how the votes actually get tallied and how we merge together the preferences of all these people into something coherent. Um, so I do think it would have been more difficult, but I absolutely don't think that it's impossible um, to do that, especially if the method itself, the end point, the, the input method for the voters is still simple. We're not ask, we're not changing to something that's asking them to, you know, write an essay about every candidate and then we'll have them graded by retired elementary school teachers, you know, in order to determine who wins or something like that. But it definitely, there's, it would definitely be, I think, more difficult. But um, that just comes down to if you want to do that, you got to make sure that you can explain it in some type of, you know, under a minute pitch, something that's going to be clear to them. And it, 
and ideally is not going to be a black box, like I said earlier. Ideally, it's not going to be something where you have to say, well, we hand wave all this away. No, you need to be able to explain it. And that's part of where I think, you know, STV, for, for example, which I think is great, I think, you know, it's still, like, it's complicated to explain to them. And then as people with a, a deeper interest in this, the whole time you're explaining something, I will tell you, if you ever, you know, petition for any type of change like this, the whole time you're explaining, and I will tell you if you have studied it, is that you're going to have all these little, like, footnotes and asterisks, asterisks, like, popping up in your head as you explain something. You're like, well, there's a caveat about this I should really get into. And you get worried and you get, can get lost in the weeds on some of it. And you just, you got to keep it simple. Never lie, never obscure, never obfuscate, but just, you know, tell them, you know, this is the basics of how it works. And now, you know, I will get into the weeds with you. We will go together into this place if you would like. I'm happy to do that with you. But, but here's the basics. And just try to keep it simple and straightforward. And I mean, I think a lot is possible. But it's scary. I mean, people are afraid of these changes. I mean, I look at British Columbia. They, they could have had proportional representation. Right? Last year, I think, they had a referendum on it. And then it didn't happen, sadly. And, I'm sh and I mean, I know the powers that be tried to explain it. They had great provincial... Um, money behind uh, videos to explain what the options were to improve their government and it just didn't happen and i think you know it's just because change is scary and um but it's doable i i do think it's out there i mean look at the I, just the fact that i just said british columbia just had this referendum um you know maine switched over to uh ranked choice we, we have cities across the country who are switching voting methods we switch to approval. St. Louis is hopefully going to have it soon. That shows that they're not only um, do, do we live, in the end we live in a time when people are considering these things. They're, they're willing to look at this stuff. And I, th I think, you know, the winds of change are behind us and we can do this. It's just, we gotta, you know, try to stay focused and try to stay simple. Unlike this conversation that I'm having with you right now. Wonderful. I um uh, I think we're we're reaching about time. Is that right, Caitlin? All right. Yeah. Um, uh, there aren't any more questions in the chat. So. Okay. Um, I really want to thank Jed and Andrea and everyone else who was able to to be here today for this discussion. Um, I, you know, it's so exciting to know that we've we've done it. And I think it's, it's very strange remembering all of the stress and anxiety that built up through this process. And then finally to know that like, oh, this, is this the wrap up meeting? Did, did we already have the party? Are we done? Um, <laughs> yeah. And I suppose, you know, it's, it's not done, done. We still have to see the election. I'm very excited to see the results. You know, I'm really hoping it's over 60% on, on some candidates. We'll, I'm hopeful. we'll see, like, fingers crossed, because I think that that's a really big endorsement, both of the method and also of the, of the candidate. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's hope that uh, St. Louis does really well. And I think we're all very excited to see not just how Fargo does, but how North Dakota does in leading the nation in efficient and effective voting reform. Who would have thought it, huh? <laughs> I, I have to um, point out as well that with this being the very first approval voting election, we all know how simple it is. We've been talking about how simple it is, but we want to make sure that every single voter is able to fill out their ballot and feels comfortable and confident. You know, that ballot says vote for all the candidates you approve of, um, but this is the first time they're gonna see a ballot that says that. So they might be confused and they're not um, going to be voting in person at a polling place where they can ask questions. Um, so that's why um, CES and Reform Fargo are um, putting together an education campaign just to remind voters, remember on your city commission race, you can vote for as many candidates as you approve of. This is how it works. This is how simple it is. Um, and so that, you know, that education campaign costs money, of course. And so if you are willing to, um, $5 even can get a postcard sent to 15 Fargo households just to remind them about how approval voting works. Um, so we would definitely appreciate any contributions that um, you all might be able to to provide to just make sure that this first ever approved voting election goes smoothly and the voters, you know, understand how how to uh, use approval voting.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're very thankful for the grant that CES gave us. And yeah, and if any of you out there want to donate to us as well, we'd, we'd appreciate it. You can find out more at reformfargo.org. I really need to update the website. I'll get that done this week. But right now, I mean, the reason I have a hard stop here is because we are, you know, working on filming stuff for a commercial that we're doing right now. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, cool. yeah, that's, that's, that's why. Yeah, I'm pretty sure one of the commission candidates for this year is actually standing outside that door right now. So I got to go. Okay. <laughs> you gotta, so. <laughs> Take care, Jed. Jed, thank you for all, right, all of your work. Andrea, thank you so much. And, and for can, all of your volunteers in Reform Fargo, good luck. And can I, I'm sorry, can I just ask a quick favor? Sure. Um, <laughs> I see that Dakota is on the line. And I, as far as I can tell, it looks like also our youngest and cutest volunteer. <laughs> Might be in the back seat. I don't know if Gigi uh, wants, to, hey, video. wants to talk about hey, her experience of volunteering hey, with um, <laughs> approval voting, but uh, yeah, Gigi went um, to many. Would you unmute uh, Dakota, yeah. Caitlin? Yeah. Yeah, I'm oh, unmuted. We oh, uh, yeah, we were just coming back from a fishing trip, so she was in the background. They got sick of me doing this. <laughs> oh, so now you're alone. Oh, I saw her back there earlier. No, she would have liked to have said hi, even though you're all strangers to her, you know, mm -hmm. except for Jeremy. But uh, yeah, they're gone. They left me because they oh, okay. yeah. don't hang out anymore. Yeah. So. No. Yeah, they well, it's nice to see you, Dakota. <laughs> yeah, you too, Jen. Oh, man. Yeah, we knocked so many doors together. Gosh, Dakota and I, gosh, we walked through neighborhoods. I mean, between the two of us, I think, I mean, Dakota, I mean, how many doors must we have not? I mean, what, 2,500? 5,000 um, somewhere? We knocked so many doors. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> knocked 400 doors with me. So that did yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah. G G G G did. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so that speaks to just, and she wasn't always with us. So, yeah, we definitely yeah. did some footwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can Rainy, talk about yeah, strategy it, all uh, day, but, but really it was GG. I think that kind of sealed the deal. <laughs> For all of yeah, us. That's what well, it was. well, let's yeah, let's do another sure. event. Let's get let's get Gigi on. Um, yes. You know, no, <laughs> I, and I'm in, I'm entirely serious. We love these calls. We love you know uh, having these conversations. But even better, we love inviting you know all of the supporters for the Center for Election Science and you know have, like so much of what we're doing is building community um, because there are so many other places that need us that need this help. And when they see this, when they see the conversations we have, they know it's real and they know mm -hmm. that that it can be done. Um, so. So thank you. Yeah. So I'm gonna quick call out the names of all the, the volunteers we had just collecting signatures though. I gotta say, Andrea Berry, Cheryl Courtney, David Derrick, Aaron Grace, Jack J, Joe John, Julie Kathy, Kevin, Lydia, Nick, Ron Tyrone, Whitney, and Zach, and then me, I guess, in the end. And I'm thankful for all of them <laughs> who worked on this. And that's just signature gathering. That is not all the people who were out there knocking doors with us. And yeah, going to every type of neighborhood in town and making sure that we hit them all, so. It's a big deal. All right. Thanks, well, everyone, for thanks joining for us. I got to go. I, yeah. I've got a get out, of here, out there. He's going to shoot me in All right. Nah. We'll be putting this on YouTube uh, shortly. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And um, don't forget, you can always email us, uh, get involved in the Discord, um, and join the newsletter. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.